All right, we are talking Miami Dolphins football on Prime Sports Network, and we want to let everybody know that if you're a Miami Dolphins fan uh, or if you just want to find out what's going on with the Dolphins, you can check out uh, another interview that I did with uh, our special guest, uh, Jason Sarney, who's coming up here. And uh, we are going to talk about uh, the Miami Dolphins and their entire team and their depth chart and what they need for the draft. But if you do want to find out a condensed version, the top three draft needs, you can check out the R Lads Football Network. We're going to have a link in the description of this video where you can check out that interview we did on our lads but right now we're going to go in depth with jason and since jason's on here for the very first time want to find out a little bit more about how you can find uh dolphins content uh all over the place uh whether it's uh on a website uh or all sorts of social media angles including youtube so uh you've got dolphins talk you've got dolphins wire uh, you've got youtube so uh you're a busy man when it comes to the miami dolphins jason you know what? I love it. Uh, I love following the team. It's been a passion of mine, as I think you might be able to see. Yeah, but uh, yeah. a little bit. I kind of, I, I kind of show my hand immediately on these things. But uh, it's really a pleasure. I love talking football in general, and I very much appreciate you having me on. You got it. Looking forward to that, this conversation. So let's go ahead and get right to it. First of all, let's uh, start on the offensive side. And uh, I tell you what, why don't we start with what you believe is is part of their top needs? And it was uh, actually uh, top need number three, uh, the wide receiver position, because even though you got Tyree Kill and Waddle, and that's a very dangerous one too, as there is in the NFL. If, all you got to do is take a look at the rlads.com depth chart that we're posting right up there for the viewers. And you can see that, all right, well, Brexton Berrios is a nice player and he can return kicks and he's, you know, he's pretty reliable at what he does. But other than that, there's just not a lot of players that would kind of pop out uh, on, on the screen there at you. And so even though the Dolphins do not run a lot of 11 personnel, Still, Tyree Kill is kind of getting up in her age, and you mentioned that. Um, and at some point, they're going to need to find Jalen Waddle's long-term partner. And they also could use a little bit of depth. 100%. And uh, I think the problem is, uh, you know, they, or it was last season, is that they completely relied upon those two way too much. And they really didn't even care to throw to a third option. I mean, Braxton Barrios was the highest targeted returning dolphin of who you see on this list, and he averaged 2.1 targets per game. That's not a lot. So uh, it's almost – it's not anything against Braxton Berrios. His bread and butter is really just returning kicks. He doesn't drop the ball. He's just a solid guy in the return game, and he is just a tough-minded receiver. When he gets thrown to, he generally makes a play. Eric Ezukama is going into his third year who had one target last season. He just hasn't gotten onto the field injury, playbook, what have you. And R River Craycraft is just one of those uh, – great guys on a team uh, he's never going to get more than three four targets a game so there's no doubt that they're bringing in to look at odell beckham jr tyler boyd they're looking at these guys so the draft is probably another low-hanging fruit to draft one of these guys to maybe as you said uh be a long-term running mate to jalen waddle what is uh before we get more in depth uh with the team what is their draft capital like Draft capital is looking like a first, which is number 21, a second, which is number 55. The problem is, and they have a long gap all the way to 158. You know, they're out of the third and they're out of the fourth, you know. So they have a big time problem with those. I I, I feel you build your long-term roster with, with seconds and thirds and fourths. Yep. Uh, you need to hit on a one, and teams that do end up going to the playoffs, teams that don't just try to do it again. But from the longevity you need those second, thirds, and fourth to continually hit. So I'm upset that they're not in those middle rounds, and 100 picks to wait is quite a lot. So, you know, two six and the seventh after that, the problem is draft day trades. I did a little bit of a research the last four or five years. No draft day trade with the player that they selected after that trade later on or before has worked out. Not one. Liam wow. Eikenberg is the only one on that roster since 2019 that there's been a draft day trade. You know, moving back. For example, they moved back to the Packers. They drafted Jordan Love. Dolphins drafted Noah Igbenogany. You know, so that didn't work out whatsoever. And Liam Eikenberg was a move up where they moved uh, – I'm sorry. Uh, 
Yes, they moved up to go two picks to the Giants to move up to, I think, 42. They drafted Liam Eikenberg. That has not worked out. So okay, they might so, need to so stay put. That doesn't mean he won't make a trade. It's just that it hasn't really been all that successful. Correct. Even though there is – because you haven't seen a need like this, though, or have you in a few years where they've had that gap. Oh, they've had no. They've had weird draft scenarios in the last two years. This they is the have. first year in Mike McDaniel's tenure that he actually has a number one first round pick. So that's fun in and of itself. Last True. year they started with uh, a second, had a third. Then I think they skipped until the sixth and seventh. Year okay. before that, they didn't start until uh, the third round. So, so they're used it, to this. They're used to having a couple oh, of rounds. Of they, they are. They are. <laughs> but uh, it's almost like you know, uh, they traded those valuable picks for, you know, you got to put Bradley Chubb as a, as a draft oh, yeah. pick recently. Tyreek Hill is a draft pick recently. Yes. So it's not like it hasn't gotten any fruit, but certainly not in April. But the Dolphins are excited for at least a first round pick this year. And sooner or later, you are going to need to stash your roster with draft picks. Just sooner or later, because it's going to, you know, like you said, the Chubbs and the Terry Kills of the world are great to have. But sooner or later, you know, that the depth, just like you were talking about, the players you get excited about, third round, fourth round, fifth round, and so forth, those are the ones that do make up the, the majority of your roster. And if you don't have enough of those guys, that's going to cost you down the road. So, We'll see if the Dolphins start to uh, think more in the lines of that uh, in a few weeks. Okay, so let's uh, – so and, – and before we move on from wide receiver, if they were to consider one, because it's going to be interesting, you've got like the top three guys that are going to get drafted early, probably in the top 12, top 10. And then you're going to have uh, – you know, you're going to maybe a little bit of a gap between the next group. So Dolphins might be a part of that. Who would you consider as a, a first round pick for the Dolphins right around where they're drafting? Uh, your audio? My bad. Brian Got Thomas, it. Brian Thomas Jr., LSU, I think is that all around receiver in that range. Like, obviously, right. they're not going to get Harris, they're not going to get neighbors, they're not going to get, you know, Odu's, yeah. you know. So, looking at that sweet spot, I think if Th Thomas is there, it's if one or two players are there, you have to think about it. But if a couple of those linemen, trench guys, and offensive linemen are gone, sure. and Thomas is just sitting there, I think the Dolphins take two seconds and run the pickup. Okay. Uh, other receivers, I think they can maybe wait until the second round. Xavier Leggett, uh, I don't know if I don't know Mitchell is going to make it to the first round. He's another guy, Texas guy, and of course you have Xavier Worthy who broke the record for. 40 yard dash and McDaniel loves himself some speed merchants, but they need a tall receiver. I don't know if Keon Coleman is the guy in the first round. Um, you know, th th there's a few other guys uh, that you might want to target day two. But then again, if you don't pick a receiver round one, round two, you're not getting anyone inside the top 20 in the position because you got to wait till day three in the back end of the round five to get one. So going to be interesting. All right. Now let's go to tight end. Uh, we'll stay with the uh, receivers. And if we take a look here, uh, it hasn't really been part uh, this position really hasn't been part of the offense uh, right. for quite some time. Um, John o. Smith was brought in, you know, he has some ability. It's, 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 it's uh, even though it's like, it seems like he's only had success with one coach. And uh, so it would be interesting to see exactly what happens here. Uh, do you think based on how little the tight end seems to be an impact in the passing game with McDaniel that they might be set at tight end, or do you think they might still be looking to add somebody late? I wouldn't be shocked if they get a developmental day three guy. Cause round six, round seven, there's like four or five guys that might entice them tall blocking, maybe get out and passing a little bit, but I like the John o. Smith move from a Band-Aid standpoint, one or two seasons. He could run out to the catch, and he could be utilized in the red zone. The Dolphins did not have a single tight end touchdown produced last year, and that's wow. not saying anything negative about their guy who was their number one in Durham Smythe. When his number was called, by the way, this is a good fun, fun segue, he was the third most targeted per game Dolphin last season. Not just what – Dolphin, the tight end. Wow. Wow. Right, exactly. And that is exactly why. That's exactly right. And that is why they need a number three wide receiver. And this whole tight end nonsense 
is so weird that yes, underutilized, but all Durham Smythe did when he got his number called was lead the Dolphins in success rate at 77%, and he produced first down. So I love Durham Smythe. He is my unsung hero on offense for the last two years. But uh, he's not a guy who needs to score touchdowns. He'll just pick up a first down once or twice a game. <laughs> okay. All right. So so uh, th there's really no scenario that you see them using a high draft pick on a tight end. If if for some reason Bowers is there, uh, and it was I your first pick, you mean? Yeah, correct. I, I don't. I, I would be shocked if he gets past two or three teams that would just the quarterback would be yeah. begging to draft him. But you have to think about it. If he gets to nineteen, they don't have as we spoke about the capital to move up to get him. And I don't think there's really anyone. Maybe if uh, the kid from uh, Sanders from Texas is around round yeah. two, may have to consider that because that's a good overall weapon that could be your number three target, but not a WR. It's a TE. So I, I wouldn't be minding. I wouldn't mind that at all. Yeah. Uh, look, it's probably not going to be Bowers, but there's going. It happens in every draft. We all know this. There's going to be at least one player that's going to slip. And we all know it. Thousand percent happen. So you never know. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the other skill positions first. And at running back, um, obviously, Mostert uh, with an incredible season last year, but he's 32 this month. Uh, he's had injury issues before. And normally you see a, a running back have a season like that. And, it, it, and you, you think the next season historically kind of comes back to the mean where it's like, yeah, okay, but you can't have that great of a season again, right? Especially at that age. But no matter what, the fact is, is that they have the the, the young weapon uh, right behind them, a chain. Do you think that, though, as often as they run with the two running back offense, that they're satisfied there? Or do you believe they really have to get an impact number three? It's a very interesting question because I like Jeff Wilson. I like Savan Ahmed. Um, I do think that Chris Brooks could be that guy. Chris Brooks is an undrafted free agent from last year, made the roster. Uh, I'm looking for a short yardage guy. I'm looking for someone who could actually pick up that third and short, fourth and inches goal line touchdown scenario. They don't have that. Raheem Mostert scored 21 touchdowns overall last year, but none of them – I don't want to say none of them, but it wasn't like you could rely on him to go right through the middle or a chain right through the middle when they needed it the most. In fact, that was kind of a problem with McDaniel and his play calling was third and short, fourth and short. You see a lot of tosses, a lot of slants, a, yeah. lot, a lot to do with that was, was almost like, all right, we have great runners to the outside, but I don't want to run them directly up the middle. So, yeah. so there's, there's intrigue there with the type of runner um, if someone's sitting there, and again, here's that gap, but McDaniel loves the sixth and the set. I'm sorry, Greer, general manager Chris Greer, loves the sixth and the seventh to bring in running backs. He does not pay for running backs. That is that is the Aldi grocery store position for Chris Greer. He is not paying premium brand name. But you're going to get something that looks just as good as he might even hit a home run like Raheem Mostert. Okay, that sounds uh, interesting. And H-Hand, H, -hand. H -hand's a grand slam, of the, yes. potentially. Yeah. <laughs> do you also think that that is, do you think that's scheme when you're talking about the philosophy of, well, we're going to, I'd rather, I feel more comfortable uh, getting the ball uh, off to our speed guys on short distance, or is that we don't have the personnel on the offensive line that I trust to get that extra yard? You nailed it. That B, the latter, uh, one thousand percent. If they had two or three, you know, just plug uglies that could just move, you know, heaven and earth, uh, it might be a little easier. But again, you're putting up Raheem Mostert, who's fragile. You don't want to run him in A and B gap. You want to run him to the outside so he can kind of scamper out a lot, like he did this year. So he played sixteen games. You know. Okay. That. And we'll get into that next. Um, okay. And then, of course, quarterback completely set. I mean, White. Thompson no Penix. No Penix Jr. It ain't no happening. Penix. Let's get yeah. it out. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let's go inside on the offensive line. And uh, this is also a position of need. We talked about on the other video. And uh, you can understandably uh, get that because not only did they lose Hunt, uh, Williams, the center last year, banged up, still an unrestricted free agent. And so you look at the rest of the unit right now, 
Uh, they did add a uh, brewer from Tennessee and Driscoll from uh, the Eagles, even though Driscoll, like he, he doesn't play. So we don't really know what, what, what the Dolphins have there. Uh, but uh, what, what do you see, first of all, from the starters? Do you think that they need to go out and bring someone in to start right away? Um, or is most of this just depth? Most of this right now, as it reads, is depth and veteran. So basically in a disaster right now, like let's say if Teron Armstead wasn't in the equation, we're talking a very thin and not dominant offensive line and nobody who is going to be necessarily a Pro Bowl candidate outside of maybe even Austin Jackson, who only had one out of four good years. That's Austin Jackson on the right side blocking to his blind side. But Brewer's a guy who's a center could also play guard. He's better in run blocking than pass pro. Teron Armstead's going to play half the season. So you have a guy like Kendall Lamb, who's a decent swing tackle, and your inside is half empty with the right guard being vacated by Robert Hunt now going to Carolina. You have Isaiah Wynn, who is almost a uh, an injury-prone kind of journeyman who finally found his way in Miami, was playing great football, but then got hurt. So we're bringing him back. You're bringing Robert Jones back. You have Liam Eikenberg. So you got a lot of three, four, five, sixes, you know, but you don't have ma major ones and twos in terms of just awesome guys that you can rely on. So – they need to draft one, and I think they have to draft one of the first two rounds. Absolutely. Okay. And so um, do you do you think that Brewer ends up starting at center, or do you think it's possible that uh, their first-round draft pick or their first pick overall, whatever that ends up being, uh, could be a center? I've that is a position, believe it or not, I, I love I, as a Dolphin fan, you know, and as a Dolphin historian, oh, yeah. you yeah. know, you go back to Langer, Stevenson, Ruddy, yeah. Pouncey, and then what happened? We're doing this <laughs> positionless football where everybody's getting a chance to play center, and there hasn't been a pure center that I think the Dolphins have wanted to bring in. There is one, I think, in the draft this year that everyone is loving, Jackson Powers Johnson from oh, Oregon. Yeah, yeah. It depends on who you ask. He's either gone by 15 or he's going to be available at 40. Uh, and that puts the Dolphins right in the middle. If he's there, there will be Dolphin fans that kind of, you know, scream and moan if he is not the pick. I might be one of them. Yeah. Uh, I've been doing a lot of these interviews and I'll tell you right now, uh, he, his name has been brought up more than any other player. Yeah. And so that leads me to believe there's no way he is lasting. First of all, he ain't lasting outside the first round. That's, that's, that's a lot. I agree with you. I yeah. agree. Cause I don't think there's three teams that I believe are on the radar. Let's call it Miami, Jacksonville, Dallas. I think all of these got Pittsburgh, you know, I think all of these teams in Pittsburgh is right before Miami. So that's, Oh, that would be heartbreaking. That yeah. for some reason, but the intrigue on Jackson Power uh, on, on wow, Jackson Powers Johnson. I sometimes fun for the name is he can move Brewer right to one of the guard spots. So yeah. that's right guard have win, and then all of a sudden, boom, you're solid until you have to do what you need to do with Teron Armstead. What is up with Win? Because Win was uh, considered one of the top young guards in football a few years ago, but it just seemed like his game is stagnated a little bit. Uh, is is that the case? Uh, how do the Dolphins like Win? Oh, love Win. I mean, he didn't fit in, in New England. You know, he actually I think he was on the Jets as well, but he was kind of like that little journeyman here, and he found his way in Miami in one of those rotations and just had had a run of like seven excellent nine. Seven or nine good games, really good games. And he he got injured and he was out for the year. But they brought him back on, on a yearly, as they like to do with, with these kind of guys. They brought Kendall Lamb back, and Kendall Lamb's a 10-year veteran uh, who had said this is going to be his last year and showed the contract on social media. This is my my last run. So they've done that nicely in, in getting those kind of reserve or depth guys. Okay. But when, when healthy at his peak potential, it could be a very solid left guard. Okay. Uh, and Jones, uh, is Jones serviceable? Same I, serviceable, yes. Reliable for 17 games. Uh, we, we, with all due respect to, to Robert, would hope not. But serviceable, okay. yes. Good story, undrafted. Like him. 
Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm a Michigan fan, so I, I know Ryan Hayes. Uh, is Was Hayes just a seventh rounder, a developmental guy? But, yeah, I'm not really expecting much. Or is there a possibility he could develop? Yes, yes, yes. You know, uh, seventh rounder, a little bit of a flyer, uh, developmental, sure. I believe on that Michigan team, they were the best offensive line in the yes, country. They were. So, you know, Jeff, uh, you got to take your risk on him. And Ross, you know, being a Michigan guy, you know, you probably want to keep the Michigan guy around for a little oh, longer. Yeah, that's true. Stephen Ross, you know. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Stupid and tangible, but yeah, is it? Well, <laughs> keep him happy. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Okay. So, uh, all right. So offensive line, uh, offense in general, I think uh, we're done there. Let's go ahead now and uh, move on down to the defensive side of the ball. Uh, and I have to start off first of all, by talking about the coaching uh, switch. Um, because what I, what I read, uh, I'm not a dolphin fan. What I read was that, um, we Fangio was just too tough on the players and the players didn't go for it. He's old school, wasn't communicating with them. So that's why Anthony Weaver's here. He's a player's coach and he's going to be able to communicate better with the players. Nobody's saying that Fangio and Weaver can't coach, but that that was like the, the, the driving force behind uh, going from uh, an old school guy to this new player's coach guy. Is any of that true? Very accurate. Uh, I think that, you know, there was a bit of a stubbornness to Fangio. I mean, he could be the greatest guru and mind in the world, uh, and much like, you know, kind of a real job, a real organization, it could be a very smart boss. But if your employees aren't fully happy going in and out of the office, it's a problem, even if there is production. Uh, so with that said, you really hit a lot of points on the head. Before they were hiring Anthony Weaver, who I'm a fan of, I'm glad because it's exactly the mold that you mentioned, players, coach. That's who I wanted. I didn't want uh, – uh, what am I going to say? I, I, I didn't want like an authority. Tative, total, you know, uh -huh. I, I didn't want that kind of coach total control, but I, I wanted a player coach who could relate with these recent years of players. Anthony Weaver is not so far removed from his playing days. You know, I know that there have been coaches in the league who have played, but I want closeness to this generation and how these players kind of take the coaching, you know, the sure. whole social media era. It's a little bit different than the 80s, 90s, a little different. Yeah. Okay. Uh Okay, now as far as scheme, how do you see the changes, the the, the more the bigger changes that you see with uh, going from Fangio to Weaver? Blitzing. Um, now the funny thing is Fangio, and I mentioned the word stubborn. Um, he mentioned last the year before when when he was hired, going into last year, he was talking about all these exotic schemes and packages and things that he was going to throw in. And he said he was going to blitz when he felt the need, almost like a, <laughs> you know, and he, a lot of pressure came from the Dolphins, natural pressure and, and hurries from a statistical standpoint, but their blitz rate was extremely low, bottom eight in the league. Yeah. And they still were so productive in sacks because there's raw athleticism of their edge rushers and the interior that got just winning their matchups, but there wasn't blitzing. This would be different with Weaver. He's going to also use a heavy rotation of interior linemen, hence no more Christian Wilkins. Hello, Moneyball. You're going to get five guys in the aggregate that are making less money than half of Christian Wilkins' first quarter. You know, there, there's five guys that were brought in, three of them that you could say are, are, are startable, two are camp bodies, and they also brought in a guy today, Tyre Tart from Houston on the defensive line. So – Rotation there, a lot more blitzing amongst the linebackers. So you okay. say goodbye to Jerome Baker. Hello, Jordan Brooks, who's also a bit more of a little bit of a thumper on the inside. So we've also brought in assistant coaches who are linebacker heavy and oriented. So okay. I'm very curious to see how David Long progresses, who had a hell of a year in his first year as a Dolphin last season, former Tennessee Titan. Um, so he's going to be a, a – a guy who's going to have a second defensive coordinator with his second year of the team, but I just think he's a, a ready-made football player. So if Brooks and Long could take to Weaver and those rotational defensive tackles could work in tandem with Zach Sealer, let's see, it could be pretty solid. And the secondary, I think, as we'll probably go into next, I think improved 
during this offseason process, believe it or not. Uh, okay, so then does that mean that you believe, just taking a look at, and then the other player will be added uh, to the depth chart here soon, but do you think that they're set or um, – because there's, there's nothing wrong with having this, these types of players. Uh, it's very cost effective as well, no question. Um, but there's no, I mean, Siler is a very, very, very underrated player. We know that. You know that, of course, more than anybody, um, especially after last season. But uh, do they need to use a high draft pick? on the defensive line because yeah, it's nice, but we got to get it. We got to get a star. We got to get a difference maker up front um, who should also be pretty cheap, especially if you wait until your second pick, you don't have to spend a first round draft pick on one of those, but guy, but do you expect them to use a high draft pick on trying to get like a difference making young player up front? It's a great question. And it's almost like a full circle potential answer because Chris Greer, general manager, again, he took over full control, like Mike Tannenbaum, gone 2019. Chris Greer was the GM in 2016, 17, 18, but he had a boss. 2019 was his first heavy control. His pick was Christian Wilkins. Now Christian Wilkins is gone, yeah. and it's almost like, uh-oh, this is deja vu all over again. Yeah. Do you pick one of the Texas kids, uh, you know, Sweat or, 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 Murph or Byron Murphy? Um, different kind of athletic build of a player, but similar to what they can be, especially Byron Murphy, who is a little undersized, but remarkably strong and athletic. So if a guy like that's hanging around, I, I believe there's one or two kids in Florida state that could fit the mold oh, yeah. um, for, for first in the second round or even I love third him. round. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's also Chris Jenkins from Michigan. Oh, another Michigan kid, but here's something to, to, to note, too, when we're thinking about Michigan, before I forget, I had this note. Um, five out of the last six drafts, those drafts, 2019, 20, 21, 22, 23, four of them have gotten a national champion from that previous year, whether it's Alabama, LSU, okay. or Clemson. So they drafted Clemson kid Wilkins. They okay. drafted Waddle out of Alabama coming off a championship. They drafted Blake Ferguson, a long snapper out of LSU. They like to draft rings. They like to draft champions. Yeah. So you look at a kid like Chris Jenkins, if he's available in round two and they didn't go D line in round one, let's say they went edge rusher or if they went receiver. Oh my God. Chris Jenkins with NFL pedigree, Michigan champion oh. replay. That's a no brainer to me. A couple of boxes checked. Yeah. Check, check, check. Yeah. And, and Stephen Ross will do the waddle in the, oh, the water. Yeah. He'll, yeah, that'll be a frightening sight. But uh, we've seen it a couple of times. It is pretty. <laughs> I'll, I'll play the fifth. I'll play the fifth. Uh, oh, uh, do you think that because uh, Benito Jones right now looks to be penciled in as the nose tackle? Do you think, I mean, was that a move? because they like him as the starting nose tackle, or are they going to try to add someone else in there? I mean, Benito Jones is a kid who was undrafted. The Dolphins brought in rookie year. They they cut him. He he, he went to Detroit, I think I want to yes, say. Yes, Detroit. Or, yep. Right. And uh, I liked Benito as a kid coming out. As I love undrafted free agents. I always love the one or two that they sign. Um, so I'm happy to see him back. Uh, speaking of that, Brandon Pilly was basically Benito Jones 2023 for me. So he's going to okay. battle Jones. And then, like I said, you got the the three guys who might be kind of – or two guys, Gallimore, Harris, and even yep. the Sean Hands who are going to be battling for the last spot or two. So superstars there. Uh, with all due respect to uh, Benito Brandon and Deshaun, no. But you can get a nose tackle – just like you see here, like Pilly, you can get one of those guys late in the draft or a college free agent, and they might actually turn out to be serviceable. So um, probably not a position you need to worry about this year uh, with the amount of players they just added, like you said. Okay, so let's uh, talk about those uh, edge rushers because this is a big part of uh, the needs for uh, from our other video regarding the draft for Miami and you've got Phillips and you've got Chubb and then they bring in Barrett. Now, uh, Phillips and Chubb, what is their injury status? Uh, as per Mike McDaniel, there is no timetable. And that's the exact same phrase he used with Jalen Ramsey, which means if we're going by that logic, maybe it's ahead of schedule. Okay. So hopefully let's, 
I like to use instead of like quarters, I like to use like the holidays of the year. I'm hoping one of them comes back by Halloween, the other's back by Thanksgiving, and we're all having a Merry Christmas. Okay, very nice. So either way, they should, or maybe the most stuff they miss is half a season. And then they're ready for the stretch drive. But that doesn't mean that uh, they're done there because, um, like I said, Barrett is really uh, looking like the only other guy on the roster that is considered an edge rusher. And Barrett, even the last couple of years, uh, not like the first three or four years in Tampa, not the same. So um, is that age? Is it just staleness? Um, what do you think the Dolphins are getting with Barrett right now? Veteran leadership and the ability to, let's say, go all out until Halloween. And then when he gets some help, maybe get back into that rotation, take a game. You know, I mean, I don't need Shaquille Barrett to play 92% of the snap, 17 games. I'd like that to level off in the 70s eventually because you're going to need him in December and January to be Shaq Barrett of 2021, you know, and you can't have that in January of 2025 yeah. if you're relying, you know what I mean? So I like him to really lead the charge and be a mentor to whomever they bring in. They're going to bring in three or four undrafted edge rushers. They're going to draft one. They might sign a scrap heap one or two. Um, and of course you still have, Jalen Phillips. I mean, Jalen Phillips sure. is still young enough where, oh, yeah. you know, I, I'll, and Jalen Phillips is, is one of the best football IQ and just humans inside a helmet. So he's going to take Shaquille Barrett's veteran leadership. Very important. Okay. Um, by the way, Chubb, because we, we know he's had an, a serious injury uh, yeah. situation earlier in his career. Um, how serious was this injury? It was bad uh, in the sense that, he, well, number one, he shouldn't have even been on the field. It was in Baltimore. It actually happened about five feet from me. I was at that game, and the game was already over. Uh, he is someone who I think is going to be back a little sooner than we thought because he's just rehabbing well. It is, I think, ahead of schedule, and it is indicative of how they restructured his contract. They did a lot of contract restructuring, the Dolphins did, and that tells me that he's okay enough for them to kind of kick that can down, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, so I'm, I, I have a lot of confidence that when we see Bradley back, we're going to see Bradley Chubb back because he was on pace to lead the league, lead the Dolphins in sacks, and maybe even break a team record. But uh, that injury happened. Okay. Uh, is there anybody else on the roster as far as uh, diamonds in the rough and anybody at all that you think we need to keep an eye on from an edge rushing standpoint? No, I do not think so. Okay. All right. Okay. So inside uh, we, we talked about Brooks before they bring in Anthony Walker long has uh, really uh, developed into an outstanding player for his position. So really the dolphins are in great shape in there with Brooks and long and Walker. If he can stay healthy, I think Walker's, uh, been on the injured list the last couple of seasons to end the season. I believe I've, I've, I've heard that Tyndall. I, I have to ask you about him too. I mean, um, that, that was an interesting player that uh, just hasn't seemed to, uh, you know, uh, you know, the light hasn't turned on or maybe uh, there's something missing there. But anyway, talk a little bit about, because it looks like on paper, they're really set. Thank you for mentioning Tyndall because he went to Georgia. He was a champion when they drafted him in the third round. That was the guy I missed. But extremely fast guy. Um, he hasn't – it hasn't clicked. He's the defensive Eric Azukanma. You know, third-round pick. Uh, the, he was their first selection yep. a few years back. So he's not a guy that they're just going to probably say goodbye to this year. They're probably going to ride that wave out. However, as mentioned earlier, the coaches that Weaver have brought in, there's been a couple of linebacker-minded coaches. Yeah. And to me, that says, all right, we got a guy like a Channing Tindall. We got, you know, Jordan Brooks coming in. Let's teach him this scheme. Let's make him. I think he's going to be the kind of the green sticker, uh, Jordan Brooks. He's going to be the middle of that, that core, probably make the calls. So uh, I think he's a little bit more of a, of a middle kind of pass a pass rush from blitzing element that I think is going to be more from the inside that uh, Anthony Weaver is going to deploy that we didn't see that last year. Okay. And then let's get to that secondary finally. And then uh, of course, uh, Jalen Ramsey came on uh, late last season. So he'll be uh, starting off uh, healthy for the first time with the dolphins this season. Holland has turned into a really star player out there at safety. 
Uh, but we've got to talk about the rest of them. Uh, Fuller seems like a really good add-on, a, a very solid veteran, very good player for the one spot out there. Poyer is getting a little old. He'll be 33 this month, but you know he's still hanging on and doing a job. So let's talk at corner first, and I, you know, let's talk about that nickel spot. Now here's a player that not a lot of people out of Miami really know who he is. How good is he? Is he really a starter that the Dolphins can count on? Um, is that the case? Are they satisfied with what they have at nickel, or are they going to try to upgrade that spot? Cater Kuhu is a very interesting story going into year three and another under i mentioned the term undrafted free agent a lot uh -huh. and that that's that's a common thing and there's another undrafted kid nick needham who is coming back for his third contract who plays you know the funny thing is he started his career on the outside which is what he's slated as right now but he played outstanding slot corner a few years ago actually was the top rated slot the nickelback who didn't even let up a touchdown, the top PFF graded nickelback from 2022, I want to okay. say. And then he got hurt last year, but then you had Cater Kohu who slid right in two years ago, you know. So this past season, Kohu had a little bit of, I guess, sophomore slump, but really did okay uh, overall for an undrafted guy who really had a sure. kind of absorbed the loss of Jalen Ramsey and an Xavier Howard, who was not the Xavier Howard we all knew. You know, he was playing at 70, 60% of capability. He's no longer there. So with Jalen Ramsey, hopefully healthy across from Kendall Fuller, you got Cater Kohu to hopefully, I guess, this is the rubber year of his. You know, he had great. He had, okay, let's be closer to great. Let, let's hope that this is closer to great. Okay. And do you, and so do you think the Dolphins feel that way that, and you just mentioned Needham as well, that they're not going to need to worry about that in this draft? Uh, it's interesting because, you know, one way or the other, Chris Greer loves his defensive backs, loves drafting corners. Okay. You know, he loves, you know, Javon Holland was a second round pick. Um, even looking back to some other players in Dolphin history, there's always a safety that kind of gets drafted and kind of, rises above so okay. i wouldn't be surprised if they have a day three safety in there but at the same time needham is a guy who could play safety and here's the asterisk jalen ramsey could play a little bit of safety too and he alluded to that with now weaver coming in he has a chance to maybe freelance a bit more okay. whereas vic fangio did not adhere to jalen ramsey's request to be a little bit more freelance and do a little bit what he wanted to do and sure. be a little bit of a chess piece. So there's four or five players that can be chess pieces right now on this team. Okay. In the back uh, Saran Neal, he hasn't really played a whole lot, but the special is, teamer. that's what he's here for. Yeah. Okay. We've, I, I love special teams like, you know, a little bit more than the next guy. Uh, we started out as a little bit of a joke a couple of years ago on social media, but I've really learned to love guys who have owned that role. You know, you might not be a number one, two, three at the position, yeah. but you know what? You're listed as a corner, but you know what? I'm a gunner. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to cover this punt and I'm going to tackle this guy. I'm going to down the ball. Yeah. I love those guys. Yeah, and it looks like they have to add some more players for sure in the secondary because even just the depth chart says just uh, what ten? That's not enough. Uh, you can't because some teams play ten. So uh, it looks like there's going to be some bodies added there. Now, Cam Smith, you look at his draft status, second round pick, um, didn't play at all last year, pretty much. So, what was the deal there, and what does it think? What does the team feel about his future? Very indicative of the lack of playing time last year and the fact that it wasn't injury riddled. I think it might have been a gathering of the, maybe the complexity of the defensive scheme or playbook. Uh, you don't know what goes on in. Look, you can watch hard knocks, but you don't know exactly what goes on in, in the classroom. Sure. You know, for a rookie not to get on the field, maybe I'll question that. Ethan Bonner is a guy that I think could leapfrog Cam Smith, believe it or not. He is a Speed burner from Stanford, smart kid, could tackle. He got in late last year and even in the playoffs and, and impressed. So if Cam Smith doesn't come into camp like ahead of the curve, he's in trouble. Interesting. Okay. 
Well, there you go. That's the secondary. And also Fuller uh, and Boyer. Uh, Poyer, excuse me. Um, that th Those are some really solid veterans that the Dolphins and Dolphin fans must be pretty happy that they're on the team. A thousand percent. And it goes into the mold. Like, let's say when Ramsey is lining up, let's just say he's going to be a cornerback 90% of the time. Let's just for argument's sake, yeah. you know, the, the Dolphins model the last four or five years is always one and one a cornerbacks, you know, went back to Byron Jones and Xavier. And when that didn't work out, you know, they had to make the trade for Ramsey. It would have been great if Ramsey was healthy for the first seven, eight games. Who knows if the Dolphins would have even lost a game, you know, during that stretch. So, uh, I think making the move for Fuller was, you know, it's funny, you know, classic career, classic career. If you remember like the Saturday Night Live, <laughs> yeah, classic Sheen. All right. Let's uh, talk about uh, the special teams. Tell me uh, how did they do last year and uh, are they going to be making any drastic changes there? Now, if you asked me this before this rule change, I would say, you know, this was really an abysmal unit. Uh, they're probably just going to keep the status quo in terms of returns and coverages. But with the new return scheme, it wouldn't surprise me if they think late of getting just a specialist who's just a receiver or a running back who could be that return guy if they figure out how to get some really good lanes with this new rule. Um, that's returns. Uh, Braxton Berrios is solid with just doing yeah. his job in a kickoff standpoint. I don't necessarily subscribe to throwing a hand back there, which some Dolphin fans have said should do with this new rule. But Berrios could, could hold down the fort and absolutely don't want to see Mostert back there. I know he does that, but this year I would like him to be as used minimally as possible, but maximizing his strengths going into that 32 year old year but uh from a kicking standpoint i was shocked that they brought back bailey uh okay. not a very good kicker in terms of placement uh net yardage was not stellar and the the best punt that he made in terms of distance and where that ball landed unfortunately just landed into out kicked coverage into the arms of a buffalo bill who returned it for a <laughs> touchdown and that was the turnaround i mean his best punt of the year if there was no one else on the field and, and he was kicking into a garbage can, he outkicked the coverage, and that might have cost us our number two seed. But Jason Sanders is a field goal kicker who always has the leg. That's never been a problem. He never misses short unless it's blocked, and that's happened once or twice. Not his fault. Maybe one of them was. But it's all about confidence with him. And the reason I believe, I think you're going to like this, Bailey was brought back. Don't look at me like I'm crazy, though was because of his holding ability. Uh -oh. He's confident in the hold. And Sanders has had four different holders in five years. This will be the first year that he's going to have consecutive years of a holder. Interesting. And, and there is a difference. I've done a lot of due diligence on this between how a holder, I don't know if you're a golfer, but how a holder would hold the ball and place not laces out or in, right or left, based oh, on yeah. the natural draw of the kick of a person. It's how you line up, how you tee up, how you place your golf head. It, there are nuances to how a ball is going to travel. And sometimes a holder and a kicker just are simpatico. And, and I think that's where we are. If you've got someone as reliable and as, and, uh, and, and somebody that you just feel is uh, without a doubt, your place kicker, then you're right. Why not just give him what he wants and keep him happy? Because that is a very valuable position. Uh, every game in the NFL seems like it's down to the last quarter and big plays. And we know every point matters. I mean, we just look at San Francisco. Uh, True. <laughs> and uh, what a wild year it was with, uh, with their situation, with their kicker, even though uh, he saved his best for last and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and might've been a hero if it wasn't for uh, Patrick Mahomes. But uh, then again, I think we all kind of feel that way outside of Kansas City. So um, everyone, everyone has felt the Mahomes wrath. Yeah. So all right, and then just taking a look before I let you go at the uh, current uh, free agents. Any of these guys that could be back? Uh, you can definitely slam the book on Xavier and Howard. Um, as I mentioned before, I don't think Connor Williams will be back whatsoever. Um. This is probably a, a clean and clear delete all list. Yeah, I, I would okay. be shocked. I don't see Eli Apple back at all. Um, That's it for Ogba? Yeah, 100%. I mean, if anybody, if anybody, 
Justin Bethel from a special team standpoint, if anybody. Okay. Robbie Chosen. The hell was that about? That was a funny. That was a funny name go around for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. Is that his like third or fourth name change since he left the Jets? I believe. Yeah, and I think a lot of it had to do with NFL rules and what he was allowed to put on the jersey. Oh, how nice! That's yeah. a good thing to be concerned about. All right. So anyway, <laughs> uh, 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 give me a prediction. Uh, Dolphins, if they don't move, uh, who do they pick? What's their first pick? Oh my God, uh, gun to head. I think. Oh, wow. If they don't move, they're going to go trenches. It's going to be something on the line. And if Leatu Latu from UCLA is there, no brainer, have to pick him. I would do backflips if that is the guy that they pick. And that's the money where I'll put my chip. It's probably a bit of a long shot, but I think you need to the number one need, as I said, it's edge. I gotta go with the edge. Yeah. And we'll see how how much he drops uh, based on his injury situation. Maybe that and Greer loves that. Chris Greer loves that. It's like, you know, as some of us who go shopping like to throw the dented can and get a couple of bucks off. Yeah. It's worked for before. There you go. <laughs> All right. Excellent job, Jason. It was great talking to you for the first time. Uh, look forward to uh, hopefully many more of these uh, and uh, immediately after the draft too, at some point, um, maybe in May, that will be a good time to kind of catch up and see what's going on and hope that the Dolphins and their fans are satisfied with the draft. And um, between now and then, for Miami fans, again, we talked about uh, – and, and, again, we'll have links in the description area for everybody out there. But do you do you have a show that you do uh, like every week or do you kind of bounce around all over the place? I do a lot of bouncing around on DolphinsTalk.com. You know, we have a whole podcast network on YouTube uh, and also on uh, Thursdays. I do a round table called Krantz's Corner with uh, three of my buddies. Uh, one of them, Mike Olivo, is the managing editor of DolphinsTalk.com. Zach Krantz, uh, media personality down in South Florida, and a social media buddy of mine. He goes by the name of Dougley Durong. I definitely recommend any Dolphin fan checking all of those individuals out. It's probably my, uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, round tables that I've ever done. And that's every Thursday on Crances. That Corner airs on, on YouTube. YouTube. Crances Corner on YouTube with a K. So Crances said, Corner. And you said so. He's down in South Florida. That means where do you live? I'm one of those weird stories. I'm a New Yorker who I live in Philadelphia no, now. I would yeah, be able to tell that. I know it's like my my accent. It's like yeah. it screams like you know Midwest. No, yeah. But, uh, I was thinking Everyone transplanted that on me. first. I was like, well, he's kind of talking like a Jet fan, but, you know, he's like <laughs> Elf and you, so he's got to be transplanted. But, no, you're still there. You're still uh, – and 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 so where is that? That's in the New York, New Jersey area? Yeah, I was a Long Island kid. I was born in Queens, moved out to Long Island, and living okay. in the Philadelphia area now. So, uh, you know, it's, okay. it's fun being amongst Eagle fans. who They actually love Dolphin fans. They, they welcome us. Well, you're AFC, so – as long as you're not the Jets, then uh, as long as you're not the Cowboys, uh, they love you. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right, Jason, appreciate it. Can't wait to talk to you again after the draft, and uh, best of luck for you and uh, your Dolphin fans. Thank you so much. This is a pleasure. Anytime, Greg. You got it.